the series um, on the last sayings of Jesus. And, and this, this one is actually pretty dark. This is maybe one of the darkest ones. Uh, Charles Spurgeon uh, called it the midnight of the day. Um, and it was the darkest hour for Jesus, really personally. This saying is unique for two reasons. One, this is uh, the first, uh, or this is the only one of the sayings that's actually recorded in two different Gospels, Matthew and Mark. And also, this is the only time that Jesus asked the question, why? Why? His other statements, uh, we kind of learn, you know, a little bit about Jesus and, and the fact of, of his control and how he remembers his mission to forgive sins and to reunite people, to connect people with God. Uh, he even remembers his uh, personal responsibility to his mother. Uh, we talked about that last week. Now, our passage today, though, deals with a big question. The question we all have about pain. I mean, pain is a great equalizer, isn't it? Everybody has dealt with pain one way or the other. Whether it's physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, we've all dealt with pain. Um, nobody can say that they never dealt with it. And so, many wonder... What was Jesus talking about here? We're going to kind of take this apart. Um, but I, I want to kind of go off on a little bit, though. Um, when we think of pain, we think of lots of different ways, maybe personally or, or other ways that people convey pain. Um, and I think one of the greatest or most common expressions of pain um, or ways that people deal with it is through country music. It, am I wrong? I mean, you listen to country music and two out of four <coughs> songs that you hear about country music are about pain, right? And so I found some country music titles. These are real. I am not making these up. You can look them up. How can I miss you if you won't go away? <laughs> I, love that. I don't know whether to kill myself or go bowling. <laughs> I liked you better before I knew you so well. I wouldn't take her to a dog fight because I'm afraid she'd win. <laughs> these are really bad. And I'm actually censoring some of these because some of these are really bad. Um, if I had shot you when I wanted to, I'd be out by now. <laughs> um, my wife ran off with my best friend, and I sure do miss him. <laughs> um, I just bought a car from the guy that stole my girl, but the car don't run, so I figured we got an even deal. <laughs> I mean, these are all funny, and, and they're dealing with kind of sort of dealing with some pain issues, right? Uh, dealing with some, some disconnect, um, some conflict, some issues. And although we may not use this type of language, some of us may have dealt with situations like this in our relationships. Now, Rich Mullen, though, uh, famously known for writing the song Awesome God, I think all of you have heard that song, right? He wrote another song called Hard to Get. And these lines are in that song. And I know you bore our sorrows, and I know you feel our pain, and I know it would not hurt any less, even if it could be explained. And I know that I am only lashing out at the one who loves me most. Hmm. That's an interesting take on this, isn't it? You know, even for those of us who have been walking with God for many years, sometimes we get confused by God's actions, by God's ways. And especially a passage like this, this question that Jesus asked, it's confusing. It's 
kind of intimidating. It's a little bit scary, even. We wonder what is going on in this situation. Why is Jesus saying God has abandoned him? I mean, that's what it says, right? You know, for us, we like to try to hide our pain and our doubts because, well, if you truly trust in God, you'll never have any doubts. So how dare you? Anybody, anybody ever felt like that? I, I, I can't possibly be nervous. I can't possibly worry because that means I don't trust God. And I don't want anybody to know that I don't trust God sometimes. I'm going to be honest, people. There's times I, I trust God, but I really wish he'd catch me up on what the heck he's going to plan on doing. Because it's scary. It's scary when we don't know what the plan is. It's scary when God doesn't let it, us in on the plan at the beginning. We carry a, a lot of superficial faith. Kind of a pseudo-faith um, and the thing is, God knows. Who are we really trying to hide that kind of thing from? Well, others. Sometimes ourselves. We, we can't really hide it from God. God knows. So why can't we be honest? And for a question like Jesus is asking here, many people like to kind of ignore it. It's in the Bible, but we're going to skip over that. Because it's really, I mean, Jesus is really saying that God has forsaken him. He's not really saying that, right? So what did Jesus mean? Did God really leave Jesus? Did Jesus have doubts? Did the Father forsake the Son? Now, there have been many, many discussions of this particular question. This is probably, again, one of the more controversial questions that's ever really been discussed. Uh, you can talk to, you know, 50 different pastors, and you'll get 53 different answers. Now, commentator Matthew Henry is, is very famous. He's well-respected, well-known. And he said, yes, God did really forsake Jesus, Number one, because Jesus said so, which should be enough right there. Number two, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says that Jesus became sin for us, and so God turned his back on Jesus because he could not look at sin. But, well-respected commentator Adam Clark said, no, God did not really forsake Jesus. Colossians 2.9 says that in Jesus is all the fullness of the deity. So how can God forsake him? <clears throat> well, he can't. 2 Timothy 2.13 says that. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So God was there in Christ using the cross to bring the world to himself. And three, Psalm 139 says you can't escape God's spirit. Well, the question is easy to understand if Matthew Henry was right. And God did turn away from Jesus in the darkness of the cross. But what if Adam Clark is right? That it would be impossible for God to forsake Jesus. What did Jesus mean then? Some have looked at Psalm 22 because the first verse is quoted word for word by Jesus. Psalm 22, 8, which is more or less quoted by the Pharisees, says uh, the Pharisees fulfilled prophecy written 800 years earlier. So Jesus quoting the same psalm shows that he fulfilled prophecy too, proving that he was the Messiah. Now, there's no question that Jesus was the Messiah. We don't question that, right? I mean, we accept that. So what the heck did Jesus mean then? If fulfilling prophecy was all he wanted to do, couldn't he have quoted something a little less controversial? Personally, I think 
think that the idea was created by people who tried to leave emotion out of Christianity, out of following Christ. We try to remove the emotion because they figure no one else has feelings either. Their faith is a logical system of beliefs. But to be perfectly honest, I don't think that's a good faith base, is it? If you remote, remove your emotions out of your faith, you're just following rules. There's no real connection. You have faith up here, not here. And it's far more important to have your faith here than here. Somebody could memorize the Bible. Good job. But if they don't apply it, it's no better than memorizing the yellow pages. Do they even have the yellow pages anymore? <laughs> but it really doesn't make any difference then, does it? The thing is, your relationship with God, with Jesus, is emotional. It has to be emotional. If it doesn't involve your feelings and your emotions, your relationship is very close to being shallow or hollow. If nothing about God or worship drives you even to a potential for tears, a potential for joy, I doubt it's alive. So, maybe the question is, did God forsake Jesus? I don't think so. Did maybe Jesus feel like God did? I think that's a possibility. Let me explain. Where God removed his felt presence from Jesus on the cross. In the darkest moment of his life, for the first time in his life, Jesus felt alone and abandoned. In John 12, less than a week before this situation, Jesus was in turmoil over dying, and he heard a voice from heaven. Luke 22, from the night before this situation, he was asking God to provide another way, and an angel appeared and strengthened him. Every time Jesus has turned to God, God has spoken. And it's at this point, though, God's not responding. And I think there's a really good reason for it. Let me explain. See, Jesus, Jesus did not feel necessarily the presence of God, even if he knew the Father was there and everywhere. So we ask the same question as Jesus, why? Why <laughs> did God take away his felt presence in Jesus' darkest time? This is the ultimate in darkest times for Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you all to use your imagination. I know. It's kind of scary, isn't it? I'm going to ask you to use your imagination. Think about a conversation between Jesus and God after all of this. Jesus is speaking to God the Father. He says, Father, I'm so glad for your work through me. You brought the glory and focus to yourself, and the world will know that you are perfect and merciful and gracious and loving. But looking back, I asked you that horrible question. I cried out to you, and I felt alone. Where were you? Why did you not speak to me when I needed you most? Why couldn't I feel you? And now picture God answering. Because he's going to answer. I love you. You have now walked in the sandals that every person ever created has walked in. Or will walk in. You felt alone. You felt that your mission has failed, and even if you only felt it for a moment, you've now tasted 
the worst, worst sting of sin. The separation from me. You felt it, and it hurt you incredibly. All your days on earth, you saw the empty, pain-filled lives that have been strained and torn at and stained by sin and rebellion. But now you do not just see them, you feel them. You now know what it felt to be lost. And every one of those hurting ones of mine, the lost, the last, and the least, can now turn to you for comfort and strength. And you can wrap them in your arms and say, I understand. Did you ever think about that? Do you ever wonder? Because Jesus came to earth, right? To be one of us. To suffer for our sins. He was fully human, but he was also fully God. And at this point, now I don't know if this is exactly the reason, but I think, I think it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? It makes a lot of sense, because if you think about it, do we always hear God every time we speak to him? I mean, sometimes God kind of is silent and lets us work things out on our own, which is good. We don't have that connection to God that Jesus did. But now Jesus completely and totally understands exactly what you have gone through. Think about that. So, are you hurting? Or do you feel forsaken? Do you feel lost? I mean, in fact, we, we use the term God forsaken for a place that we want nothing to do with. I wonder if you know anybody whose heart feels God forsaken. Maybe. Maybe it's you. I don't know. If you've ever felt rejected, lost, abandoned, forsaken, here's the wonderful thing. We have a Savior that can actually say, I understand because I was there too. How awesome is that? Not the fact that he suffered. Not the fact that he had to die a horrible death. But that he understands. He gets it. It's not some abstract being that tells us to eh, get in shape. It's one that says, I was there too. Hebrews 4.15 says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses because he felt them too. And maybe he was tempted. I mean, he was tested in the desert, wasn't he? And I have no doubt that Satan might even have tempted him on the cross. Whispering in his ear, you know, if you just bat out to me, you don't have to do this anymore. And yet he never, <coughs> never turned away from God. He knows the temptations that we face. He knows what it feels like when the world is dark. God hasn't turned away from us. He sent us a savior that gets it, that understands, that knows. I want you to each think about that. Are you at that point where you think maybe God doesn't get it? He does through Jesus. Jesus was sent to suffer just, just for us. I think we can ask that question. We can say why. And Jesus says, well, I'm going to take you by the hand. We're going to walk through this together. I've been here before. I know the right way. How cool is that? Let's bow our heads together.
Lord God, there are so many times when we feel lost, when we feel, feel forsaken. We feel even abandoned. But we know, Lord God, that through Jesus Christ, we don't have to suffer anymore. We don't have to deal with it all on our own. And we don't have to question whether or not you get it. Because you do. We pray, Lord God, that our eyes are opened. And we can walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Today is Communion Sunday. And uh, on this day, we, we continue, continue a service that was started 2,000 some years ago. We come before this table joining in with the disciples. Joining in with those who, yes, even abandoned Jesus in his darkest time. We, we say in scripture, I have them. And yet, even those of us who have abandoned him, and I think we all have done that as well, we still get asked back to the table every time. I pray that you remember that this table is always open. It's open to each one of us. None of us can earn it. But yet we're all welcome. You would better to this. Lord God, we pray for your presence to come upon these elements of bread and wine. And on those assembled here, as they take part in this meal, as they take part in bringing you into ourselves, as we each take part in the grace and love and mercy that you offer everyone. So I will ask uh, if I can have our ushers come forward, Doug, or whoever. It doesn't matter to me, whoever wants to come forward.